Welcome to the channel. I'm Danny Walker. This is the Miss America 100th year anniversary pageant recap. If you're new to the channel, welcome. I'm a former title holder, pageant judge, as well as a coach, and I've worked behind the scenes at a lot of different pageant organizations. So I wanna share with you some of my insights here. If you like content like this, then please consider subscribing, share the channel with friends, and don't forget to hit the notifications so that you know when new episodes are released every week. If you wanna know another way to support the channel, then just check out the merch store and that is linked below. Little disclaimer for this episode, I don't think that I am making any friends at the Miss America organization by releasing episodes like this. But what my hope is though, is that the show can eventually come back to where it was to improve, to center their program around the contestants and what they're looking for in a competition. So maybe this episode will reach some eyes and ears of influence so that we can really restore Miss America to what it was. Was. To put things in a little bit of perspective, last year the pageant was postponed, so the reigning title holder actually got two years of service, and you would think that two years would be enough time to plan an epic 100th year anniversary, especially after what happened at the previous show. If you want to know what I'm talking about, I'm linking the recap right up here, so just Check it out and see that for yourself in case you missed that one. This year, they brought back a lot of formers. The selection panel were all former Miss Americas. Okay, cool, I get it. I can understand how that sounds great in theory. I just don't understand the technical errors that were happening during the show. So we're gonna talk about those as well as the new changes that they incorporated that I hope are gonna go for next year's pageant. Once again, the pageant was held at the Mohegan Sun Arena. I think this is a beautiful arena. I think that there's so much that you can probably do with it, but for me, the staging was a miss. Once again, last year, a lot of people commented on how dark the staging was. We saw that once again this year. It really wasn't well lit. I don't know how the people that were attending in person could really see anything, let alone what the judges could really make out from what the contestants were doing on stage. Another thing when it comes to marketing, the only posts in my feed that were coming up on Explore pages or anywhere on my social media were from former title holders. They were sharing and they were cheering on the current title holders. And that to me is a really big marketing miss to not hear about this pageant, especially coming from someone like me where my, you could just imagine my whole Explore page on social media is always pageants, 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 not just one system, multiple systems. So the fact that I didn't get any sponsored posts or related posts about Miss America really blew my mind. One thing that I think could really be improved is the wardrobe, hair, and makeup and styling of the hosts. I think that that's a reflection of the quality of your production and the sponsors of your organization. If you think about reality shows that people love to watch, like Dancing with the Stars, for example, they wanna make sure that their host looks just as well dressed most of the time uh, as, your ho as your judges, as your contestants on the show, as the celebrities that are on the show. It's just, it's a, it's a matter of how the entire production is going to look. And I think that that's something that was lacking in this production. There were several times during the show where it sounded like our hosts, Nina and Erica, were trying to cue to something else. It's sort of like when you watch a news show and they say, take it away, Steve. And then the camera moves to somebody else very quickly and almost instantaneously. And it seemed like those cues were missed. And I was like, what is going on? That stuff should be worked out in a technical rehearsal. So from a production standpoint, because I worked in pageantry, I've worked in musical theater, I've worked in live shows and in theater, it just blows my mind that these cues were missed. And that's a great reflection of the quality of the production and what's going on behind the scenes. The other thing is that when they were showing the B-roll footage of the contestants during rehearsals, the contestants did not look ready to go in the same way that you would see contestants ready to go at Miss USA, Miss Universe, any of the other top pageants you can think of. When we see the B-roll footage of the contestants, the contestants are made to look ready to go. And these video clips, it felt like they didn't even tell the contestants that anybody was showing up. We're seeing hair and curlers and no makeup. And I think that there's always a time and place for that. I think that that's, that can be done in a great way where it's like, look at how real our contestants are. But at the same time, the way that we dress 
and we present ourselves. It's a reflection of who we are. And so I just didn't feel like they were putting their own contestants in the best light on national television. That to me, it, it just doesn't really make sense. And I also think there's a really big missed opportunity here because Miss America has a talent portion. And you could really take some cues from shows like America's Got Talent and the stories that they build about each contestant's individual talent. I think that we saw that years ago when we used to hear them talk about why I chose my talent and when they started their talent, and they would have these likable clips of the contestants growing up and executing their talents. And I was like, that was, it was great. It provided some insights, but you know, we've moved on and there's other ways that we can really feature the talent, make it a focal point of the show, make it exciting there are just other ways that we can help these contestants make their talents look even better, more impressive. And so I think that that needs to be updated. I think that there's a really big missed opportunity there because that talent portion is what you're bringing that nobody else is bringing. Capitalize on it. A lot of pageants now are mixing up the way that they announce semi-finalists, changing it up every year. And a common complaint that I see from pageant viewers or contestants is leave well enough alone. You don't have to be so creative with the way that you're announcing who's getting into a semi-final. And they decided to do it a really interesting way this year that I thought could have been missed and really confusing for the audience if you're not listening and paying close attention. And I'm telling you during a live show, you're not always paying attention. There's stuff going on around you. So I'm sure there were some people in the audience or viewers at home that missed this. But what they decided to do is break up their contestants into groups of 10 randomly. Then from those groups of 10, two were gonna be selected from each group. Those two went on to compete again in the top 10. Now, what I didn't like about this is as soon as you bring out a group of 10 and you announce two, you immediately know that the remaining eight are no longer in the running. So when you bring out the next group, you know that we're not dealing with a pool of 48 remaining contestants. Now you're looking at a possible 40 contestants that are left vying for the next two spots. So it's a really, really strange for me process of elimination that I think actually removes some of the suspense because now you know, oh, these girls aren't left every single time we cut down to the next group. The introductions for the show were slow and they were killing me. And that is exactly why a lot of other pageants will have multiple mics on stage. So you're not gonna be waiting for a contestant to walk up to the mic next because those things take time. That's why you have two contestants ready to go. One says her intro, camera is on her. She starts walking away, then immediately you're queuing to that next girl. There is no delay in the show. You're adding seconds that are precious to your show and they're not seconds of value it, it was just it was so simple to me how we could adjust that and change it the other thing is they allow the contestants to wear gowns or I think whatever they want really for the introductions but most of the contestants are gonna wear gowns for this because most contestants love to wear gowns for pageants. It's one of the things that we look forward to. It was one of my favorite things. And the thing about this is that, you know, because it doesn't count for a score, we saw a wide array of outfits that I personally didn't love or think were styled very well. And I'm not gonna blame each contestant because there's so much that goes into pageant prep and a lot of contestants are wearing what's available to them. Since there is no longer an evening gown competition, I can only imagine the great exodus of gown sponsors and stores that are willing to dress a contestant for the competition considering that the gown might only be seen for several seconds instead of really featured during an evening gown competition. So really the pageants that are going to continue to have the support of sponsors are probably going to be your ones and your really big pageant states, Texas, Florida, California. Gown stores may still be interested in those specific contestants and it kind of leaves everybody else in the dust. And I think this is important and this is why so many pageants have introduction outfits sponsored for the contestants because it's gonna create a level of consistency. It's gonna add production value. It's gonna make things a little bit easier on contestants. It's one less piece of wardrobe that you're worried about, you're thinking about, and it just adds to the entire glamor of the show. It creates quality control because we can't control things when contestants are responsible for bringing stuff to the pageant unless you give some guidelines, but you can control it if you actually have these wardrobe sponsors and and I think that, you know, that to me is, it's another miss for the show and it just, it, it makes me sad and I don't think that it makes the pageant seem stylish or relevant to younger viewers.
because most of the contestants are being styled or helped by older individuals who are a part of their committees for their state pageants. So we're not seeing fresh looks. And let's not forget that the four points of the crown used to be style, service, scholarship, success. That is what the originators of this pageant really understood. And that is why Miss America used to get signed to big movie contracts back in the day. She was truly seen as a celebrity, potentially a fashion icon. And they know that when you get eyes on your title holders using fashion as one of those means that you're able to create even more opportunities and able to attract even more contestants. It's marketing, it's branding. As a pageant coach, I wanna offer a free resource to all the contestants out there who are watching and preparing for their competition. You can check out my free pageant prep course that is linked in the description below. And it's kind of a deeper dive into the steps that you can take to prepare and strategize for your next competition. Now, once we had our top 10 after all of that was drug out, we had New York, and it was funny because I had a feeling about her during her introductions when she was speaking. Alaska, who I thought was very naturally beautiful. Illinois, I had the same feeling about her during her introduction. She has this newscaster voice in that intro, and I was just like, I bet she'll be top 10. By the way, I didn't even see the prelims. Massachusetts, we had Oregon, Alabama, DC, Florida, Utah, and Texas. This year, all of the top 10 got to perform in their talents. Interestingly enough, they partnered with TikTok and they showed the contestants doing these TikTok challenges for their social impact initiatives, which is what they used to call their platform. And I didn't think it made any sense for the talent competition because a lot of these platforms are talking about serious or potentially heavy issues. And so we're playing that right before what's well, usually a fun, upbeat talent performance. There was a disconnect there. Why didn't we see these clips before their onstage interview or before a final question? I was like, why are we playing this now? Why are we watching 10 of these? The talent I loved was Alaska's. It's been a long time since I've heard a contestant at Miss America sing on pitch, and I would have to go back and really listen to it to double check that, but she was pretty right on for this. The performance was great. The song really suited her voice. So that she right there was my talent winner. Now, the other thing I wanna mention is that they went out of order here and they skipped over Alabama. And for a minute, I was like, why did we skip over Alabama? Then she came on stage, we hear her playing, and I was also confused. Once again, I, I, I was thinking, is this just a background track? Is it just me? I, why can't I hear her instrument? Well, it's because there was something wrong with the audio. That's why we couldn't hear the instrument. So get this, we moved on in the show, okay? We moved on for a little bit. And then we see Erica talking about a sponsor. And in the background, I can see all of these ladies dressed up in what looks like competitive cheerleading uniforms. So I thought, oh, this is interesting. We're bringing cheerleaders on for a national pageant. You know, this could be fun, a fun cheer performance. Why not? That is what I thought was going to happen. I was wrong. It was the contestants dressed up in what, like what I said, looks like competitive cheer outfits. And they were custom made for what purpose? For those couple seconds, who is going to wear a rhinestone encrusted gym outfit? I don't know when they'll ever wear these again. I, I didn't understand that. Then the contestants weren't really hitting a pose or doing anything. They were sort of just kind of moving around. You could see them changing up their poses with these camera angles. I was just like, Where are they gonna wear these? Then after Erica was done speaking, the feed did not immediately get cut off as it should have to go straight to commercial. It kept rolling. So Erica's done, they cut. Production starts walking on stage to move the contestants around. Guys, this is not what is supposed to happen. It's supposed to be kind of like a magic show. You're amazed, you're like, wow, how did that happen? How did they get over there, from there to there? No magic here, no magic. The amount of technical mistakes that occurred during this show from the hosts and from the crew were things that I would easily have been fired for during other productions that I have worked. Definitely fired, definitely not brought back for another show. And some of these things could have caused me to be fired literally on the spot and replaced by another host that was ready to go for the show, that was better prepared. That is what is shocking to me about this 100th year anniversary. This stuff should not and normally does not happen 
during many other untelevised competitions, so there's no reason that it should happen during a televised show like this. I know I can be a harsh critic, but honestly, Miss America, if you need a host for the show, call me up. I can help you out. After a commercial break, they brought back Alabama to re-perform her talent. I don't know how there was time for this in the show. Normally these things are timed right down to the second. So something happened, I don't understand. And she comes back, we hear that now her instrument is on, it makes a lot of sense. We hear a story from Nina's year retold by her and it sounded like she was going off script that this was not on a teleprompter because she kept saying ah and um, and that's just something that you don't want to have in your show. You don't want those extra filler words. You're going to lose the attention of your audience. And for me, it just didn't make much sense because she wasn't the outgoing title holder. I would much rather have heard from the outgoing title holder than a title holder that was there years ago. It's not her show. It's the show for the contestants and for our outgoing queen. Next, we narrowed it down to a top five and they were able to recompete in an onstage interview. Yes, an onstage interview, not a, just an onstage question. This was an interview that was conducted and it was much like the actual interview competition, but the exception here was that each contestant was only interviewed by one of the panelists. And the questions were based off of what sounds like her social impact initiative or her actual interview. So kind of follow ups to that. It was really difficult for me to sit through this and I'm a pageant fan and I can only imagine what people thought if they were flipping through the channel and happened to stumble on Miss America. You'd watch a couple of seconds of the show and go, what is this? And not be interested to stay on board. No wonder viewership has gone down in recent years. So I honestly don't have that many notes. I had a few for Alabama. I just thought that she was speeding through all of these answers because it was time. She was trying to get in as much as she possibly could. It ended up coming across in like an auctioneer. That That's how it sounded. And she advanced in the competition. And I think that the importance of that is when you advance that type of performance, you are then setting a precedent for contestants for the next year. You're telling them that this is what places in our organization. And that's going to change the way that they prepare and how they compete. So in order to get ready for this competition, we're just going to see a lot of contestants talking like this and practicing like this at home so they can get through all the things that they wanted to share on national television. That's what's going to happen. You could barely keep up with that and that's not even effective public speaking that's not a habit that i would encourage contestants to build so i i didn't understand this then so we got rid of the social impact initiative pitches which i actually thought were a little bit interesting it was kind of interesting to hear them talk about how they were going to market what they wanted to do as miss america so i'm actually more in favor of that than this i don't even think that this portion of the competition was really worth diving into so if you guys want to see it go ahead and check it out they stream this show on peacock but it was really hard for me personally to sit through. Now, I wanna say that this was the 100th year anniversary, right? And I felt that they totally forgot their reigning title holder. Their title holder who reigned for two years, I completely forgot about her, frankly, until the end of the show when it was time for her farewell. And I was just thinking, what in the world? Now, this is something that I think Crystal Stewart is gonna start doing right. She touched on this during Miss USA this year, and she talked about the fact that she wants to make this role of Miss USA attractive to other young women. Women. She wants to bring them back into the organization and she understands the importance of attracting contestants at your state level, potentially at your local level, in order to get quality contestants at your national level and have a really great show and keep building the program. And it just does not seem like Miss America is understanding that. In order to stay relevant and renew interest and grow your program, you have to have contestants interested in entering your organization. And once again, I just, I just feel like they don't even know who their audience is yet, and they need to figure that out and how to market to them. As a note, they also decided to announce the awards for fourth runner-up and third runner-up before narrowing it down to a top three. That's not something unheard of in pageantry. Now we are down to a top three, and what they did was give them a Miss America challenge. So each of the panelists, former Miss Americas, got to share a story from their year as Miss America and ask these contestants, what would you do in that situation? Kind of an interesting take. I didn't, I didn't mind that so much, but some of the questions I kind of set you up for an expected answer. 
you know, like for Miss Alabama, for example, they were, they were asking her if you were supposed to testify before, I forgot testify before what, uh, testify in court and what if you were to get a call from the opposing party the day before you were going to give your testimony asking you to change your side and essentially asking you to lie. And it's like, well, what would you do in this situation? She's like, stick to your guns and tell the story you meant to tell and be honest and share your story. What is she going to say? Lie? switch your story. That That is one of those questions where I just feel like you have to think about what are the potential answers in a way and see if you're kind of putting your girls into a box. Now after that it's time to announce your new Miss America for the 100th year anniversary and Erica gets ready and just says here we go with our second runner up and thank god Nina said wait no stop because it's not time for that yet. Erica was ready to go full force and then she said, oh gosh, so sorry, my feet are hurting. Basically, I'm ready to go home. I'm, I, yeah, me too, right? And these other contestants, I'm sure they all felt the same, but that's not really something that we say during a final show as a host, okay? We're up there happy, smiling, enthusiastic, okay? That's what we, we need to be doing that and we need to read the script. Right there, the teleprompter, it's big. We don't just skip parts of the show. And the part of the show that was about to be skipped was the moment where they brought out all the former, forever, Miss Americas. We could have, we could have forgotten all about them. These women are of all ages and they have traveled, I'm sure, from all over the country. Who knows? Maybe from all over the world. Maybe they moved somewhere. And, and they're here for the show to celebrate the 100th year anniversary and they were almost skipped. Could you imagine? Woo! Oh. I bet there would have been some upset queens. Anyways, so we bring them out, which I thought, okay, kind of cute for the crowning, I get it. And then they announced our second runner up and our first runner up, which I like, because in past years, they kind of narrowed it down to a top five and then pulled a second and a first runner up. And then you have your three remaining and you're like, who's gonna be Miss America? You don't have that final two moment. I like the final two moment. So we got to have that final two moment again. Then, I forget who read it. They misread the teleprompter and they said that Miss America receives a $1,000 scholarship. For the 100th year anniversary, they said she receives a $1,000 scholarship after you just talked about the tens of thousands of dollars that all the runners up received. Miss America receives a $100,000 scholarship, which would have been amazing to mention. Now forever, it's gonna say that she gets a $1,000 scholarship for the 100th year anniversary. Just read the script. Just read the script. Oh gosh. Ah, this is stress inducing. Like I'm telling you, I would have been fired. Y'all need help. I'm so serious. I'm very, very serious. I know girls that still dream of becoming Miss America, if you can believe it. They still do. I work with these girls. I work with these women to help them prepare for their state and their national pageants. And I support these young women. But I'm concerned about the production quality for sure. Because for the amount of effort that they put in, for the amount of money that they spend on preparation, these ladies deserve it. When Miss America is willing to accept some help, call me up. Those are my thoughts on this. I don't even, I don't even know how to describe this show. You tell me how you would describe this show in the comments. I cannot wait to read it. I cannot. I'm really excited about this, actually. I'm curious what you guys are all gonna say. Let me know what you thought of the entire show. Let's also congratulate our new Miss America. She is the first Miss America from Alaska, and I think that's incredible. I'm excited for her regardless. I really sincerely hope that she does have a great year. I, I am hopeful for that. We'll see how it goes. Good luck to her and really all of the contestants that made it to that stage. I wish you the best in your future endeavors as well. I hope that this is something that's gonna really give you a platform to leap off of to the next step in your life. Thank you so much for watching this episode though and for supporting the channel. I hope that you enjoyed it. Please share it with your friends. We're almost at 85,000 subscribers, working towards that goal of 100,000 with your help, of course. So thank you very much for tuning in and I hope to see you next time.